All right. Lock up your wives and daughters. It's time for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. I would not mind talking about my feelings. And Big Anklevich. How do you feel now? In pain? There, we're done. I guess that was fun. We are rolling. So welcome the folks. Welcome to the Jen Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 118. This is Rich Alfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to the show, folks. Feels like it's been a while, even though it hasn't. Yeah, well, we did put out three episodes in a week. So maybe since it's been more than two days, it feels like it's been a while. Okay, that's, that's good. Well, maybe we'll talk about that sometime. Maybe. But not today. Uh, what is today's story, more importantly? Today's story is Beachcombing by Ray Cluley. Okay. Do you know anything about Ray Cluley you'd like to share, or should I? I could make a bad pun and say not a clue, but uh, I won't. Thank you, uh, sir. Ray Cluley has had several stories published in various places and forms. <laughs> Was that the uh, I don't know what that unholy was. drone? What was that scary? <laughs> Many of those stories were with the British magazine Black Static from TTA Press, which is where the following story was first published. Beachcombing has also been translated for a French anthology. Called Je suis Rick Springfield. <laughs> yes. It's a very popular anthology, that Je suis Rick Springfield <laughs> anthology. His story, At Night, When the Demons Come, another black static piece, was selected by Ellen Datlow for Best Horror of the Year, Volume 3. He has developed this into a script for a graphic novel and is currently looking for an artist to illustrate it. Or a publisher willing to take the script without artwork. Or how about a podcast willing to take the story? <laughs> As well as writing his own fiction, Ray writes about other people's for those studying English at college. But generally, he prefers to make stuff up. You can find out about his latest work at probablymonsters.wordpress.com. Cool. And who do we have to thank for the production today? Today's story was produced by Sunny C., who also produced previously Death and Michelle Jenkins for us. And Sunny C is my favorite breakfast drink. That's right. It's way better than Sunny D. <laughs> it's got a lot more vitamin C in it, for that matter. <laughs> Beachcombing by Ray Cluley. I hope you guys enjoy the story. It's awesome. So check it out. Spoiler. It's awesome. <laughs> Another spoiler. At night, the demons come. Oh, no. Beachcombing by Ray Cluley. The day was gray when Tommy saw the men looking out to sea. The sky either cloudless or made entirely of one large cloud without end or beginning. It seemed to Tommy that even the sand was gray that day, dampened by a drizzle that fell in the night and by surf the color of old washing up water. Slow waves lapped at the shore, leaving long, wet curves in their wake, constantly renewed. This was where Tommy liked to walk, leaving his prints behind where others had before, and knowing he could do it again tomorrow without getting confused. The man was standing within the limits of one of these wet curves himself. Occasionally a wave would wash up around his ankles and drag away again, pulling at the cuffs of his trousers. 
The man didn't seem to notice. He clutched the collar of his long coat around his throat and looked out to the thin horizon where gray sea met gray sky, a pencil line on tracing paper. Tommy stopped where he was. He didn't like to get too close to people in case they touched him. The man was still far away, but Tommy would wait until he was gone. Instead of continuing to where the rocks curled into the cove, he examined the stretch of beach around him, looking for treasures. A bottle peeked from a shallow grave of sand, its neck outstretched and filling with water as the tide washed over it. Usually Tommy wouldn't collect his treasures until the return journey, so he didn't have to carry them to the rocks and back again. But as he was waiting, and the bottle was there, he pulled one of the plastic bin liners from his pocket and went to it. The bottle was brown. There wasn't much label showing, but it was red. Tommy thought it was probably called Bud. He shook out the bin liner, letting it parachute full with the tang of salt air and knelt in the wet sand. He dug around the bottle first. It was Bud. And then he took it up into his hands and closed his eyes. Before Tommy, the bottle had belonged to a teenage boy. He was happy, slightly muddled because of Bud, coming to the beach with a girl with red hair. He had held the girl's hand and it was warm. He had tried to hold other parts of her. Tommy didn't know why but she had slapped him away laughing. Tommy didn't know why. When Tommy brought his fingers up over the lip of the bottle, he felt where the boys had been. He had touched the girl and he had kissed her, and sometimes she liked it and sometimes she didn't, and he had left the bottle behind afterwards. It wasn't much, and it wasn't all good. Tommy put the bottle in his bag and carried it in his right hand, because it would be the rubbish bag. The wind smacked the plastic bag as he walked around in a circle where the bottle had been. It made a thicker, thicker, thicker noise that sounded in a hurry, but Tommy took his time. The man was still there, and it was still early in the morning, so he had ages. He found a polished green food box, but it was soaked and gave him nothing, so he put that in the rubbish bag as well. He liked to tidy the beach when he looked for treasures, because Sally said neatness showed a strength of character, and although he didn't really know what that meant, he knew it was good, and that Sally admired it, and so he was tidy. Anyway, if he didn't pick up the rubbish as he went, he would only pick it up again tomorrow and waste time. Sally was nice. She looked after Tommy and the house he lived in, and she knew not to touch him, but he wouldn't have minded if she did, because he knew she was nice. He had touched some of her things. The only time he felt anything bad was when he touched one of the wrappers he found in the bathroom. Sally was scared and confused and ashamed, and he felt those things even if he couldn't explain them, and he'd cried like she had done. But later... When he went to the toilet and tore off some paper to wipe himself, he felt from the first square that she was happy again, and relieved, and disappointed too, which was confusing, but better than before. In the sand at his feet was a key ring. Tommy was excited. Keys were good. Keys were definitely treasures. And even though he'd have to give these to Sally to hand in, he could hold them for a while at first and find out all sorts of things. He dropped to his knees and dug a trench with both hands, letting the weight of the bottle keep the bag from blowing away. He made neat piles with the sand he dug because neatness showed a strength of character, but quickly discovered the key ring was just a key ring. There were no keys. He shook sand from his hands and rubbed them together and looked at what he'd found. It was a chunky pink plastic heart with a short length of chain and a double hoop of metal at the end where the keys should be. 
Tommy snatched it up, grinning because hearts were good, and what he felt made him laugh with joy. A man had given this to a woman because he knew he loved her and he had put a ring where the keys were supposed to go. The man thought it was a funny kind of joke. The woman had smiled politely when he gave it to her, pleased and disappointed like Sally had been. And then she'd seen the ring and screamed, <gasps> but wasn't frightened. She had taken the ring off with trembling fingers, so even though she wasn't frightened. And said yes with a trembling yes. voice, and the key ring had been forgotten. Tommy hugged it close to his chest and pretended the man and woman were his parents. It couldn't be because if the heart was theirs, it would be washed empty by now. He put the heart in his pocket. It was the best treasure in his collection, so he didn't want to put it in a bin bag. The man on the beach was gone. Tommy smiled again and ran the length of the beach before the man could change his mind and come back. He was so happy with the heart, he didn't think about the man's footprints. And when he remembered on the way back, they were already gone. The man was there again the next day. Tommy could see him even before he got to the beach. Climbing over the little fence at the end of the car park, he saw the man standing and looking at the sea. The sea looked the same as yesterday, gray and mostly flat, and Tommy wondered what was worth looking at. Maybe he had better eyesight and could see a ship or something. Or maybe he couldn't see at all, like the man with the special dog Tommy had petted once. He went down the few steps to the sand by standing on the very edges and without touching the railing because it had too many people on it. Pavements were the same, even with shoes on, but if you walk carefully, a car park was okay. He jumped the last three steps to the sand. The sand was always okay because the sea came and washed it every day. The first treasure was right there at the bottom of the steps. It was a little spade, bright green like a jelly bean. Even though the sun stayed away yesterday, Someone must have come to the beach to make sandcastles. Tommy picked it up and closed his eyes. Daddy, right here. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Good idea. The little girl who used it was very happy, even though the dentist had just put metal on her teeth because her daddy brought her to the beach instead of taking her back to school, and she loved the beach. She wasn't very good at digging. Tommy felt how she held the handle in the middle and tipped the spade to the sand and flicked it instead of pushing it in deep and lifting it or turning it. He felt how her daddy had helped. His hands were low and high on the handle like the way they were supposed to be. He dug the sand and the girl put handfuls into a bucket. He knew because the daddy knew. And the two of them were very happy. The daddy was glad she was still a child and so was the girl, but in a more muddled up way. Tommy opened up a bin bag and put the green spade inside. He gathered the top together and carried it in his left hand because it was a treasure bag. Things that people lost and Tommy found and took his joy from. The man was still there. His long coat was open a little bit and the wind filled it up sometimes, puffing it like a dark sail. The man was like the mast of a ship that wasn't going anywhere. He wore a scarf, too, burgundy like beetroot, which Tommy didn't like, but ate because it was good for you, and the wind blew the scarf back like a flag. Tommy took off his sandals to feel the sand better, and because today he would remember to check the man's footprints. He found a whole carrier bag full of litter and went through it, but put it all in the rubbish because he didn't like the people. They were messy and angry and one of them was bullying the other one about his girlfriend. He also found a hair clip and even though it was quite away from the sea it must have been there a while because it was clean so that went in the rubbish bag too. Further along the beach he found one of the small balloon things he wasn't allowed to touch. 
It was gritty with sand stuck all over it. He nearly touched it anyway because the feeling he got was good. But Sally had found one on his treasure shelf once and was very angry and disgusted and upset about it. She said they were for adults even though Tommy knew it belonged to someone still at school and she took it away in a bundle of tissues and threw it away. He looked for the square wrapper he sometimes found nearby because Sally didn't say he couldn't touch those. And they felt good too. All excited and nervous and excited and excited. But, but he couldn't find it. He did find a comb. He thought it was funny whenever he found a comb because Sally and the people who looked after him said he was a beach comber, which was someone who collected treasures from the beach. He closed his eyes and reached for it. The man who had lost it carried it in his back pocket but never used it because he had no hair. He carried it because that's what his father used to do. Father was the adult word for daddy. This man loved his daddy even though he was gone which made him a bit like Tommy. He put it in the treasure bag after using it to make tiny little grooves in the sand. The man was still there. And Tommy only had a little bit of beach left to go before he was too close. He didn't want the man to touch him in case he wasn't nice. You could drop a thing that wasn't nice, but it could hurt and hurt if it was a person, and you couldn't drop them or make them let go if they didn't want to. The man said something. Tommy heard it snatched away by the wind and brought to him in a tangle of sounds that didn't make sense anymore because they were unraveled. He wasn't talking to Tommy, which was good because he wouldn't be able to talk back because he was a stranger. He was talking to the sea, or to himself. Then he wiped his face like he had sand in his eyes and he left. He walked to the other end of the beach where there was another car park. Tommy waited for him to be gone completely and then he rushed down to where the man had stood. The footprints moved away from the sea, long ovals with half circles following behind, a line of exclamation marks calling out to be noticed. Tommy thought the man should have taken his shoes off because he saw the sea come up over his legs sometimes and now his feet and socks will be soaked and his shoes will squelch all the way home. If there was someone like Sally there, she might be angry, especially if he traipsed sand into the house, which was when you made a mess. Plus, if he got sand in his shoes, it would itch between his toes later when they dried. Tommy put his own toes over one of the prints, balancing on one foot and lowering the other one slowly. The man's feet were much bigger than Tommy's. He lined his heel up with the curve of the half circle and brought his foot down completely, filling only half, the sand squirming up between his toes, but not itching because it was wet. The man did not want to go home because it didn't have someone like Sally there. That was all Tommy felt. He stepped forward into the next footprint to make sure. He needed to lunge a bit to make it in one step. The man was going home because he was sad, but he would come back tomorrow. He would come back very early in the morning. For a moment, Tommy felt something of himself there, too, and that felt weird and confused him at first. The man had seen him, that was all, but Tommy didn't think of that straight away. The man didn't want Tommy to be there standing around all day, but it was Tommy's beach first. Maybe the man was shy. There was a shell near one of the prints. He knew it didn't count as treasure because there would be nothing on it. But he took it anyway and put it in the treasure bag because Sally liked it when he made her things out of shells. He suddenly felt very lucky to have someone like Sally, so he spent the rest of the morning looking for more shells to make her something special. The next morning, he got up very early, much earlier than usual. And the man was not there. The day was a darker gray than usual because there was more night left in it. And it was quieter than usual because the air had sleep in it with the salt and the seagulls. 
Tommy had his bags already out of his pockets but not open, and he ran the beach so he could start collecting treasure before the man got there. He held the bags out and they made noises like machine guns and the wind coming in off the sea, so he pretended to be a plane from one of the big wars. He had a medal at home from one of the wars and it used to be his favorite treasure until the key ring. The black plastic streamed behind him from each fist and he thought it looked a bit like smoke if you pretended hard enough. So he spiraled as if he'd been shot by Nazi bastards even though he didn't know what they were and collapsed to the ground in a spectacular explosion of sand. He found a pile of clothes. Tommy found clothes on the beach sometimes. He found swimming clothes and t-shirts and underwear like pants or the funny tops that girls wore. Sometimes he found those balloons with the underwear. When he found clothes, he usually only found one at a time, but here in the sand was a folded pile of one, two, three, four, five, six things. Seven if you count the shoes, nine if you count the socks and shoes separately. He never found so many all at once and never in a neat and tidy pile that suggested a strength of character. The shoes had the socks inside and sat on top of a pair of shorts on a folded shirt and some trousers rolled up on a coat with a dark red scarf poking out like a tongue. There was an envelope sticking out from under one of the shoes, but it wasn't addressed to Tommy. It wasn't addressed to anybody. But Tommy knew unless it had his name on it, he couldn't look. He recognized the coat, even bunched up, and the scarf. The shoes had sand on them, and some had fallen off onto the clothes folded underneath. None of them were wet, so maybe the man had learned his lesson about getting too close to the water. Maybe he took his clothes off to go for a swim. Tommy looked out to the sea, but as usual, there was nothing there but the bumps that were the waves and some seagulls bobbing on the top of them. Looked very cold. He wouldn't take the clothes even if they were treasures, but he would touch them, and he did. Sobs burst from Tommy the moment his fingers felt the stiff linen of the trousers that were nowhere near as soft as his tracksuit bottom, but that was not why he cried. His chest heaved with the man's pain, and his head swam with the darkness he couldn't put into words. And was so lonely and sad and empty like a flat tire. He was on his own all the time like Tommy, except Tommy had Sally. And he had people that came and cared for him sometimes, and this man had nobody at all. He had gone somewhere to be lost and never found because it was the only way he could let go of something bad. Tommy wailed and pulled away and rubbed his hands in the sand. He fell on his back and stared at a sky that had no moon and no sun and was somewhere in between. He could feel the pain spreading out from the shoes and socks and shorts and shirt and trousers and coat and scarf. He rolled away from them, but he could still feel it. He ran home faster than he ever had. He came back running even faster, even with the black sack slung over his back, bump, 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 bumping him all the way. The man was still not there, and that was good, because Tommy still didn't want to be touched or talked to, but he did want to help the man. He skidded to a stop and an abrupt slide, landing on his side and kicking up a puff of sand that settled on the plastic bag with a sound like telling off even though he was doing something good. He opened the bag and all his treasures were inside, every one of them. All the things people had lost and he had found and that held good things, happy things inside. He took them out in handfuls, smiling and how they tangled and tickled in his head and he dropped them on the clothes so when the man came back he would see them. He left coins and bottle tops and jewelry he didn't need to hand in, toys and lolly sticks and lipstick. He scooped postcards and pens and sweet wrappers from the treasure bags and left them on the clothes as well. It didn't show a strength of character like he wanted to because it wasn't tidy because he didn't want to touch the clothes again. He wanted to 
bury them with everything he had that was good. The man would pick up the comic book, the train ticket, the broken phone with all its conversations, and he would see that he could be okay if he felt things that were nice. Tommy gathered all that he had and piled it high, careful not to cover the clothes completely, careful not to cover the letter because he didn't want the man to be lost and not found. He saved the best for last, putting the chunky pink plastic heart on the top like a shell on a sandcastle. Then he got up and went to where the man would have stood if he'd been there. One set of footprints came down to the wet sand, all curves and circles because the man had no shoes on. They didn't come back. The man must be in the sea. The sea washes things clean. The man wouldn't know that because he was older than Tommy. Tommy looked out to sea and watched for a long time. Then he went home because maybe the man was shy and wouldn't come back with Tommy standing around all day. Tommy's heart would wait for him. And now, a word about today's story. Hi, I'm Ray Cluley. Um, I wrote Beachcombing, which you've just been listening to. I uh, hope you liked it. Uh, definitely liked writing it. Um, mainly thanks to Tommy. Uh, without Tommy, there would have been no Beachcombing. He, he pretty much is the whole story. Um, until him, uh, Beachcombing was just a, a pile of neatly folded clothes on the beach. Um, an image in my ideas book uh, for quite some time. Uh, something I wanted to use because I thought it sounded particularly sad and, and lonely. Um, but then when I started thinking about who might find those clothes, um, I come up with Tommy, and then after him, everything else just fell into place, uh, which makes Beachcombing my only story so far that's emerged pretty much whole. Um, and I was able to write the whole first draft uh, in one sitting, which is also a first and hopefully not a last, because that's, that's brilliant. I hope that happens again. Um, I really like Tommy. Tommy lets me uh, look at the confusing world of, of being an adult, uh, mainly because he's a child, um, but also because um, of the the gift that he has, the the ability rather, because it's not really a gift for him, um, of, of touching things and, and learning a little bit about the last person to touch them before him. Um, if not for that gift, he'd be a rather lonely character. Um, in fact, that's something I tried to parallel with the old guy on the beach. Um, in one point, he's literally following in that guy's footsteps, trying to learn a little bit more about him, um, because he represents someone that Tommy could become, because he, he stays out of the the, the bigger world. Uh, but he's not entirely lonely, he's got his treasures, um, the little bits and bobs that he finds on the beach, they're his, his contact with the outside world, if you like, um, and through them he's able to, to make relationships um, of a sort of second-hand nature. So thank you, Tommy, for beachcombing. Uh, and once again, I uh, hope you liked it. Tommy has popped up again in the novel I'm writing at the moment, so maybe you'll hear a bit more about him soon. Um, enjoy the rest of the show. All right, everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. Yes, that was beachcomber, beachcomber, little Bo Peep, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sonny, Sonny C, for uh, not only producing, but he pr performed the story. He I, uh, performed that... some bits and bobs in that story. Oh, uh, yes. I want to thank Harry Potter for his author's note as well. I just, I long to speak that way myself. Yeah. Wish we could sound as cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sonny, for the work that you did on it. That was really nice stuff. I was really impressed by it. The The whole conglomeration of everything that came together on that story. Sonny's narration was really good. I don't know, it really expressed the childishness of the main, not childishness, because that's kind of supposedly like a negative term. But childlike osity The childlike osity of the main character was so well expressed in the way that he read the story. And he did a great job producing it, putting in all the sound effects, adding in the sounds of the people that went along with the items that Tommy touched. And then he was able to feel their memories and their feelings. And it just really came across really well. I thought he did a great job. 
that really reminded me of what Scott Pig did with Welp, where there was that scene where the guy was looking at the photographs and he made us like ad lib. Well, sorry, he made you <laughs> ad lib a scene. Anyway, there were several points in this story where Sonny asked us and other people to just ad lib conversation, you know, proposing to a girl, uh, screwing around, uh, teasing, something like that. I don't know if that was in the, the story. Uh, and then the old man. How long did we go with the old man <laughs> having a conversation with his dead wife in the sea? That was unique because he just said, make something up that's sad about talking to your wife. I mean, I don't know if you can even hear it in the story. <laughs> the, the boy, Tommy, doesn't really hear what the man is saying. And so it, I guess it's only natural that you don't hear his conversation. But when somebody asks us to do something like that that we've never done before... It's unique because here we've done over 100 episodes. It's rare that somebody says, make something up along these lines. <laughs> Usually we're just reading or we're performing. We're interpreting lines and to just be somebody else. What would he say? I, that's, that's nice. And it's taking it in a step that I wouldn't have thought to go. I don't know. The, 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 the music was really minimal until the very end of the story when you'd hear just like a couple of notes with the piano um, I, w I smiled like every time it happened because it was something that you would see in a movie just there for tone. Right. The music went really well. All the various uh, songs that he had, piano, uh, I don't know, it really conveyed the emotion of the story really well. I suppose we ought to do a quick cast list before we get too much further. There wasn't a whole lot of cast. It was mostly just the narrator who was Sonny. But there was also, Rish played several of the characters that were uh, in the background, as well as I played a, a character. And one of my daughters helped, helped to be the, uh, the child that was making the sandcastle with but me. But who was the girl that was grab-assing? <laughs> the engaging couple. Oh, sorry, sorry, let me go back. <laughs> the ones that had the uh, keychain and the ring on the keychain was Desia B., uh, I don't know if she's related to Sunny C or not, if that's some kind of uh, alphabet initial thing that's going around. If you donate to the show, we'll give you the alphabet duo. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm confused. <laughs> you can check out her website. She does have a link in the show notes, so you can see what Desia B is all about. I really enjoyed that stuff. I, I, I thought the scenes that he added in, and really great. The stuff that Desia, if I'm saying her name right, did. I really enjoyed that scene. And uh, I don't know, there's just something really magical about this story. I don't know what it was, but it really uh, captured me. It's interesting because this is one of those stories where... Originally, you know, we, we've talked about how we have a thing for, you know, if we're going to do a story on our show, we want to have a part in the story. And so a lot of times the story will come in and Nicole will read it and say, eh, this is a good story, but it's a one character. I think we mentioned it when we did The Troop, which had just the main character who was a narrator. That was it. And this was another one of those stories where, again, it doesn't have several characters there's not a part for me and you to play although Sonny managed to find a way for us to get a part in there which is cool but it's one of those stories that it's not the kind of thing that we would normally do and I'm so glad that Nicole thought to ask and say hey what about a story that's pretty good but only has one character would you guys like to see that too because gosh I really liked this story it reminds me of if we go way back, there was a story that we did called Aqualung, which was a, a, another story where it was kind of a similar thing, where a person, it was a really melancholy story uh, about a guy who's scuba diving. He's a scuba diver for the police, I believe, and he's down there looking for evidence or something, and he's got a terminal disease, and he's working through in his mind whether he wants to... Uh, kill himself while down diving or not uh, it, it's a really similar thing to this one where there's this guy on the beach who wants to just wander off into the water and give up his worries 
it was something just really interesting how this this little boy comes along and just wants to take away that sadness in whatever way he can. And he's a boy who's got a lot of issues dealing with other people because if they touch him, he's zapped into their emotions and into their feelings and into their mind. And if they're not a nice person, it hurts, like he says. And And yet he's still giving enough that even though he doesn't want to touch this guy, if the guy comes, he wants to make him feel better. And so he gives him all of his treasures, everything that makes him feel nice. He gives to this guy to try to make him feel like, I don't know, it's something really special. Maybe we should have run this at Christmas time. <laughs> Could have been a good holiday story. Better to give than to receive, right? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, there was a sadness, but also a decency to the main character uh do we ever find out how old tommy is how old would you say the kid is i don't think we find out exactly but i think he's definitely less than 10 years old my guess would be six or eight but not seven (laughs) okay this gift that he has is there a name for what he has for tactile i don't know empathy empathy for objects the gift that that Tommy has, it's kind of a, to him anyways, it's a curse. A lot of times you, you have that kind of things with, with a somebody that has a bill, especially with like the X-Men or something like that. You know, their ability is sort of a curse to them. And then at some point they have to figure out how to make it something else. I wonder if there's a way that Tommy could do that, that he could get to the point where being able to, tap into people's minds by touching their things or touching them from what it sounded in the story you touch them and you get a much more direct connection as opposed to touching their things that they had previously touched it seems like this tommy kid you know is like the author said he's, he's following in this lonely old guy's footsteps you know he's on his way to having a really lonely life because he can't get close to people because when he does, it's too much to handle. I wonder if there's a way for him to uh, someday be able to use his gift for good. Can, can you just put gloves on? <laughs> I'm sure he can. I mean, is that all? All it takes. He could be like Rogue and have those long gloves and then take them off and take away Pyro's power when he's trying to blow up the cops. <laughs> You're referring to the movies, aren't you? Yeah. I that's how she worked it i mean it had to be physical contact with her skin is he able to sense when he's st- walking in the old man's footsteps through his feet i don't think so i think well through his feet yes but i think it's because he's barefoot he's walking on the beach barefoot and so he's able to so let's so see that would be a yes yes okay <laughs> yeah I, there's got to be a name for for being able to sense something by touch i i I don't know what it is, but yeah, the the kid does have a, a lonely life ahead of him. <sighs> Not being able to know what other people are thinking or feeling or the secrets they keep or are worried about is frustrating, but knowing everything has got to be awful. You don't want people to know what in your heart of hearts you, you, you're thinking about or, or wanting or, or worried about or, or frustrated about. There's certain things that you keep to yourself for a reason and everybody keeps to themselves. Right. In any story with telepathy or empathy or, you know, some kind of Mind invasion of, 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 of privacy, it's that thing that I never say on the show. I have vowed never to say. But it's something you that you you stab with, that has a blade it's, it's on each side. It's sharp on both sides of it. And uh, the the frustration you have of not understanding why your wife, for example, is reacting in a certain way, was probably preferable to knowing, you know, if it's something that you would rather have not heard, or right. you know, it's just like, or, or something irrational. Was it you? That would tell me that she would get mad at you because of something you said or did 
in a dream. <laughs> yeah, that did happen one time where some, I don't know what it was that I said. I don't remember what it was, but it did something in uh, one of her dreams. And then she woke up the next morning and was still mad at me for whatever it was that I'd done. And it wasn't until a while after having woke up where she realized I'm mad at him because of what he did in my dream. That's really not very fair, is it? <laughs> well, I think emotionally, everybody has those kind of things all the time. Where it's like, it's not rational. It doesn't make sense. I feel what I feel or I'm thinking about what I'm thinking about. And I don't even know why. And to know that about somebody else or about everybody else... It seems like you'd be able to get close to somebody if you knew what they were thinking, but it, I, th I think it would actually be the opposite. It would prevent you to, from being able to, to trust, from being able to be with somebody. I, I, I don't know. I mean, if you ever found out that your mom wanted to just get in the car and drive away every day, <laughs> but she never did, that would change your feelings for her, your opinion Whereas that she never did is the important thing. Not that she had that inclination, that, 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 right. that thought. I don't know. I, I, I may be totally wrong. I, I've never had, okay. I, I've had a little bit of psychic ability. Yeah. You know, yes, that I have prevented a couple of assassinations and stuff through it, but for the most part, it's caused me nothing but, uh, okay. Well, the, the lottery numbers, the winning lottery numbers thing, that was cool. And, the hot chicks knowing what they needed to hear at the time. That was cool too. But everything else was, okay, the ability to get away with crimes and to kill whoever I want to and never be <laughs> caught for it, those, those are kind of nice too. But everything else is just, just odd. And, and the poker, the being able to beat people in poker, that's, that, that's kind of nice. But all of those other things were slightly inconvenient. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I, I mock, I guess. Uh, the story wasn't really something that opened itself for mockery. It was, it was just really nice and positive and sad and in the way that my favorite songs are. Right. It kind of makes you think of, uh, we talked about it or we'll talk about it soon on That Gets My Goat, a Jonathan Colton song where you have an upbeat, fun song like Code Monkey about this computer programmer who keeps on working at this place because there's this cute girl that he just loves to talk to and he can't seem to get her to finally go out with her, get her to let him buy her a soda or whatever it is that he's trying to do. And, you know, someday he thinks he, he, he could even have everything, even a pretty girl like that girl. But for now, he just keeps on working at this crappy job so that he can see her pretty face each day. All right. You know? Lots of songs like that. Or the song of the uh, sad vampire who just wants to be able to see the uh, sunlight one more time. But he can't because he's a vampire. You know, it's got that, that melancholy yet fun. You know, they're all upbeat, kind of fun, happy yet sad at the same time, kind of all mixed together. It's, it's something that I, I really like with whatever I can get it with. You know, I, I, I like that. That combination. We'd like to thank our sponsor for today, Jonathan Colton, for uh... <laughs> the the other thing that we didn't talk about. Maybe the only thing we didn't talk about about Sonny's production was the sound of the surf coming in and out. You know, the the waves, the gentle, and the the seagull. It's funny. I I'm not a Californian. I, I didn't grow up on the beach. But there's something so soothing and something uh, so, like going home for me with the sound of the ocean. And, and I don't know. You grew up in California, not on the beach. Right. We were but in California, do you have that same connection to the water? or what? You, when I die, it's going to be like the old man. Yeah. Um, You're going to fold your clothes up and walk naked into the water? And I, I'd never considered the whole folding your clothes up thing. That's kind, I guess. It's but because folding your clothes up shows the strength of character, which is something you don't have. That's why you never that's considered darn that. sure. <laughs> I, 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 I think I remember you even talking about a story that you had uh, planned where that was the character's idea. 
he, he had a lot of regrets and he was just going to go wander out into the ocean and take the plunge, as it were. Something happens to send him on a new adventure instead. That did happen to me. I went to the beach and just thought it would be fun to walk into the water and see what happened. And I only got about to like waist level and a lifeguard with one of those things, uh, a horn, bullhorn, a bullhorn said, sir, sir. And, and I turned around and I thought, wow, this, this guy is on the ball. He saw me going into the water. I, I think I'd taken my shoes off and put my wallet in my, and my keys in my shoes. But, but that wasn't what it was. He said, we, we're asking everybody to get out of the water. There are sharks <laughs> right beyond where you are. You know, get back out of the water as soon as you can. And I looked and I could see their, not the dorsal fins, but the tail fins. Oh. I guess they were spawning in the water. It's hard to gauge just distance because either they were close or they were large. But I'd say like another 20 feet or whatever, they were right there, these, <laughs> these sharks. Wow. And I just stood there and I watched them until I think a, a minute later, he's like, sir, I'm not kidding. You know, you know, you need to get out of the water. But to me, that Don't was... Don't make me employ my taser, sir. <laughs> That's right. That was a really interesting experience. And, and standing there, I, and I, 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 I'm scared to death of sharks just because <laughs> of Jaws. But it wasn't scary at the time. It was just like, wow, look neat. They're around me, and, and they're alive, and they're, they're, they're large. Um, and they're hungry. And so, yeah, eventually, I think I even walked backwards back out of the water just so I could keep watching them and daring them, if you would. You know, <laughs> he's like, come on, yeah, I, I'm right here, free meal. Yeah, you think you're so tough out there in the water. Why don't you come take me on on the land? But they didn't bite me or eat me, and, and so there's no real happy ending to that story, unfortunately. <laughs> but... But, At least you know what would have happened. You said you wanted to walk out into the water and see what would have what would happen. What would have happened is you would have been shark bait. Ooh ha ha! I, yeah, it's it's sad that uh, in, I didn't. There were so many things in L.A. I wish I had taken pictures of. And in those days, I didn't have a digital camera. And if I had, I'm sure it would have been stolen. <laughs> but that would have been a really cool thing to take pictures of or video of. of and I, it was just me assuming that they were spawning. I can't... I mean, maybe there were tons of fish that were spawning there near the shore and the sharks were eating them. Mm -hmm. But the guy said, you know, we're asking people to stay out of the water because of this. And, and, and anyhow, I just... I've always been drawn... To, not always, but I am, as an adult, drawn to the ocean and just there's something, uh, I guess, inviting about it. Or there, There's a word and I can't... I'd have to touch a seashell to, to be able to tell you what the yeah. word is. What do you feel about that? you have to touch that? the cover of the dictionary and then you'd feel that word enter your mind. Alluring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally feel the same way about the ocean. I, I wonder if there's, I guess there must be folks out there that find a beach annoying or awful or something like that. I don't like sand. <laughs> it's rough. <laughs> right. and it's something and it gets everywhere. Not like here on Naboo. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm the same way. We've unfortunately, sadly, you know, growing up in California my whole life, I didn't go as often as, I mean, it was only a few hours away, easy to get to. And yet I didn't go all that often. But the times that I did go, you know, it's really, really enjoyable. One of our favorite vacations that we did as a family was we went and went camping and stayed right on the beach in Santa Cruz and where we could just walk out of the campground and go down the hill and there was the beach and uh, really wonderful. And I remember one of the, one of the days that I think of, you know, sometimes is, is one of the best days of my life was this time that we went to San Francisco and we went to the beach and my son was just a little, little tyke at the time. He was less than two years old, I would say, or if he was over two, just barely. And he just loved the ocean, you know, and he was just so excited. And he's like, oh, here comes another wave. Oh, let's get ready for it. You know, and we were doing the whole thing where we would play and we would jump in the waves and we would wait for the wave to get close. And then we'd run away from it, try and outrun it and all those kind of things. And 
it was just one of those perfect days, you know, where everything is just good. It doesn't matter. I mean, even bad things could happen on that day and everything went so well. They didn't even mind. I remember another day that I felt that way was a, a, we had a Christmas that was just, you know, I don't know what the deal was. It was half the time at Christmas, you know, you, they're like, eh, I didn't want this. I want something else or whatever, That's you know. Mine. Yeah, you get those kind of things a lot on a Christmas. But one year at Christmas, everybody was just happy with everything. We played together, had a fun time. And if I remember right, it was the year that we got our PlayStation and my wife just can't handle the 3D games. They make her sick. She gets like motion sickness from the whole movement from the 3D games. And I mean, that night my wife tried to play the games that we got and she got sick to her stomach and wound up throwing up and going to bed early. And even that was not enough to spoil the day. It had just been such a wonderful day. And this day that I'd had on the beach with my son was the same kind of a thing. It was just so peaceful and fun. And, you know, we were able to just enjoy the best of each other. Yeah, I don't know what it is and why it was that it was that way. Because, yeah, there was, I mean, we got lost when we were driving around San Francisco and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And yet being there on the beach with my son was enough to make it just one of the best days of my life. And uh, in, in South America, when I spent my time down there, a lot of people live on the beach or at least close to the beach. You don't want to go to the interior where it's just jungle and monkeys and alligators and stuff they live on the beach <laughs> that's where everybody is you know all the cities are right there and and gosh the beaches were so unbelievably gorgeous down there there was one place that i was at where they just had this beach and it was rolling sand dunes and the sand dunes went right down into the ocean people would drive their dune buggies around over it and just park it and go swimming and just beautiful stuff down there and yeah there's something about that that the continuing swishes of the waves as they come in and out and the the wind blowing through the palm trees and what have you i guess depends on where you're at whether you got palm trees or not probably wasn't any palm trees at the english beach that tommy was on but yeah there's just something really special about the ocean and i guess the place where the ocean meets the land especially I don't know. It's it's funny. Like I said, there must be people that don't like it. They don't like sand because it gets in stuff. But yeah, just being able to be there on the beach and, and feel the, the relaxation of it all. It's just something really special. Time for a smoke. I'm out of here. Oh, wow. Have you been here all the... No, of course he hasn't. Hey, you know, we talked about Sonny and we talked about uh, Ray Cluley and all that they uh, provided to the episode. But one person we forgot to talk about... Announcer um, man, yes. <laughs> yes. Let's not talk about him. Continue. That's a good idea. Um, actually, no, we got, we got uh, an artist who volunteered to do the art for today's episode. Oh, you mean that episode art doesn't just spring fully formed from the, uh, was it from the site of Zeus or Athena or? Something like that, yeah. Alec Guinness. One of those. Somebody like that. Uh, that guy that played Hercules, what was his name? Steve Reeves. <laughs> there you go. Um, no, actually, it, it, uh, it must be created by someone. And uh, about, uh, I'd say a month and a half ago or something like that, this person said, hey, you know what? I got an email from her and she says, hey, I, I'm an artist and I can't do, you know, producing or the other stuff that you guys are always asking for, but I would love to do episode art for you. And I thought, wow, that that would be awesome. Um and interestingly, I think we'd already recorded an episode where we asked people to do art, but we hadn't put the episode out yet, so she uh, managed to jump the gun on that just a little bit. But her name is Lisa Wild, and uh, yeah, she just wanted to, uh, to contribute as well. So she did this art, which I think is just absolutely gorgeous. I don't know if you uh, agree with me or not. Well, I'd better agree at this point. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but yeah, she just put together this great art. It looks absolutely gorgeous. And uh, since that time, we've had several other people who have also volunteered to do art for the show. Uh, we've got some art upcoming that have been done. Uh, and another uh, bit of art that was done by Lisa that's uh, 
upcoming still. So there's many more treats to come for folks. Um, but since we're talking about this, I thought I would mention uh, when we mentioned the, before in the show that we would like people to do art. A lot of people came forward and wanted to do stuff. And uh, frankly, it was more people than we had stories to give them to do for future art. But we had lots of stories in the past that never got art. And we talked about, I think you talked about once in a show where you were saying, oh, I wish I could go back and I had time to just go back and do art for all of those because I'd really like that. But, you know, there's not enough hours in the day for that kind of stuff. And so we just chalked it up as something we could never achieve. But people have come forth and they started volunteering to do the art for the old episodes as well as the new ones. And uh, I just think that's... Uh, awesome you know all of a sudden we've got art for like our first 12 or 13 episodes where they were just blank as blank could be before and uh it, it's so cool to uh be able to fill in those gaps that we had from before um and even to to coordinate all these things i started a, th a thread on the uh the forum and if people want to do art for some of the old stories you can come to that thread that's on our forum and you can just post on there and reserve a uh, story and say hey i want to do uberman or i want to do mars in his hand or creature of the sea or something like that and although i think all of those have been reserved already so don't ask for those but <laughs> um but yeah you can come and reserve a story and then you can uh, put together art for it and uh, mm. we'll even put a link to whatever you want to along with your art uh, in the uh, show notes that go with it. So if you're interested in doing art, swing on over to the forum and check it out because uh, we've got a whole system all set up for it now. Plus you get this special Monarch of the Glen tote bag. Oh, wait, no. That's right. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, we're, uh, we're also, you could say, auditioning artists. If you do good art, then we'd surely look for you to do art for future episodes once all the uh, past episodes are used up. So if you're interested in kind of becoming part of the team, you, it could be like being one of the slush readers or being the, you know, being Sudden Death in the Coal, the submissions editor, or being one of the producers, except for in this case, you'd be an artist. Hey, speaking of which, do people know that submissions are closed? Probably not. I, I We actually got a submission the other day, and I had to send it back to the guy and say, hey, sorry, we're closed. So maybe we ought to mention that. See, you're so much tougher than me. I nearly read that submission thinking, <laughs> well, it's easier for me to read the story than to try and find a nice way to say we're not taking submissions. <laughs> but yeah, submissions are closed for a while. Uh, we figured sometime in 2012 probably early 2012 right i was guessing august maybe february or august one of the two but uh yeah we're, we're we've gotten a little behind on submissions and so we're trying to catch up uh, and get everything read and evaluated and sent back and or accepted and so to give us time to do that we're tr we're, we're closing off the uh the spigot where the, all the f submissions are coming in from. But don't worry, we'll be back. I wish I had your confidence. <laughs> uh, I think this is fine to end, right? Sure. Autobots, transform and roll out. Hey, uh, thank you, Ray Cluley, for sending us this story. I, what it was doing in Black Static Magazine, a horror... I, I'm assuming with a name like that, it's a horror magazine. Yes, it is. I don't know, but... Who am I to say? I, I, even if we were a Western story podcast, we would have accepted this. Yeah, story. that's the thing, man. It doesn't matter what kind of a magazine you got. When you get a story this good, falls in your lap, you're going to take it. So I, I can understand them going for it, most definitely. And again, again thank you, Sonny, for producing top-notch production. Good job, man. And... Uh, Thank you for listening to the show. If, if you uh, are new to the show, we got a bunch of episodes to make you not new. Yeah. So and, you can uh, go back and check them out. Or you can just sit around and wait for the next one to come out. They don't come out as often as the ones that have already come out. 
those are already there. So plenty to enjoy. Magic that way. Oh, one other thing. Uh, Announcer Man is here. <laughs> I mean, we haven't... Announcer Man, say something. What does the word Dune Steve mean? Well, you know, the funny thing is, it turns out that the word is a Pennsylvania Dutch word. Ah, that would explain why it sounds so strange. What, yeah. What does it mean? Do you uh, speak well, Pennsylvania Dutch? <laughs> no, I, I did a little research to find out about the word. It, it, it actually, among the Amish, Dune Steefing a person is calling for that person to be shunned and cast out of the community. Oh. Calling someone a dune steef is the uh, Amish equivalent of saying, dude, if I wasn't a pacifist, I would so kick your ass. I wonder if there are a lot of Amish that use the word dude. Probably. Ask a stupid question and you get a stupid answer. There you go, sir. Right. Announcer man he is the only intelligent one here. Okay, well, on that note, thank you for listening all the way to the end of the episode. Last thing, I vowed to ask for donations every episode, especially when it hurts. So please donate to the show. <laughs> Sorry. There is a button on there you can push to donate. On Five there, bucks by on there, he means on the uh, website. Yes, I'm sorry. I was uh, getting ahead of myself. It is possible to donate to the show to help us pay our authors to help us get up in the morning. And uh, if you do that, it would be appreciated. That's right. And if you donate, you get an incentive episode. Yes. Got- last call, folks, for something out there by Big Anklevich. Just heads up there. If, uh, if you never got to hear that story or that episode. I mean, we did a whole episode about it, kind of like we just did for... Beach beachcombing and we'd be happy to give you that episode if you'd be happy to give us some money <laughs> that's right and time's running out a new one's on its way so you don't want to fall behind so please donate thanks for listening have a great rest of the whatever night it's always night because that's when the demons come oh that's right all right see you later folks bye The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. See what I did there? I did. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. See you later, everybody. Take two. I can get that email up. Not the only thing that you have trouble getting up. Uh, yeah, that was difficult. Much like your erections. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. All right. I'm going to pretend to be a teenage girl here, and he's going to be the teenage boy. It's going to be awkward, but I am going to slap him at least once to make it worth our while. My while, anyways. <laughs> All right, let's see. Just, I'm, all I'll do is giggle, so you won't have to worry about it. You just say, come on, baby. Come on, baby. You know, something it's like hard, that. It's hard, man. Okay. <laughs> come here. No, 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 come on. Come on over here. <laughs> You can stand a little closer than that. <laughs> what, do I stink or something? Come on. <laughs> well, oh. yeah. <laughs> we don't want you talking, do we? <laughs> well, I'm talking. <laughs> I couldn't help it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's more like it. Hey, what? <laughs> what? What do you expect me to do? Don't. Ah, uh, well, you, you, you want me to think you're ugly? Is that, S- is that it? Stop. Uh, you say stop, but you really mean uh, the opposite of that, actually. Don't. Okay. Stop. Don't stop? Is that what? Is that what oh, Don't I stop. Yeah, it's a, that Glee song. How's that go, baby? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. Okay, that's really that's, difficult. Man. That's going to be good enough. We're going to move down to the <laughs> other ones. All right. Act sad. Mumble stuff to yourself. Cry. Okay. You want me to go get squirt bottles so you can 
spray on some tears. No. Probably doesn't help in audio, does it? I think we'll just depend on acting. Brilliant. Thank you. All right, so, uh, oh, old man, here I am again, see. Long time no see. <laughs> but here I am, old and alone and useless. No place for a person to be, unless they're Big Anklevich. He's a douche. Oh, oh. come on, sir, please. It's hard. It's not kind. Okay, now you do the uh, Okay, bullying. you want me to be the bullying guy? Now I'm bullying about your girlfriend? Like... Oh, hey, I, I gotta go. My, 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 I told oh, my girlfriend okay, that, that kind I would of be a bullying about six. a girlfriend? See, so I was thinking, like, what, what am I trying to take you... What? What, are you, your girlfriend's too good for me? You're not gonna let her blow me too? Come on. Well, Come on, mate. <laughs> this guy can't be English. Sonny, this is the part of us uh, pretending we're doing the sandcastle, okay? Daddy, right here. Oh, yeah, that looks good. A good idea. How, how high do you want the wall to be? Two inches. Two inches. Are you sure that's tall enough for a sandcastle wall? Maybe five. Five? Okay, five inches. You know what we need, too? What? I think we need some shells. Have you seen any shells? Oh, I've been collecting them. Good idea. Are they in the bucket? Yeah. All right, can you grab it? Thanks a lot, Gertrude. All right, yeah. that will be Why that. Why did you call me Gertrude? <laughs> because you're playing a character. You're not really you. You're pretending to be somebody else, and I made up a name for you to be Gertrude. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm a girl. Gertrude is a girl's name. You <laughs> didn't know that, did you? I like Mackenzie or... Mackenzie or, or McKenna something like or something, something like that because those aren't real names or Kylie Kylie oh okay you're getting closer if you'd said Kaylee I might appreciate it ready yeah you ready to record yeah are you sure yeah okay here we go I couldn't figure out what had happened to his parents and who who the girl was that he was with all the time. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It sounded like maybe his parents had died. Either that or they were absentee-type parents that just had him with a nanny all the time. I think the girl that he was always with was a nanny. Oh, okay. I got the impression she was young, too. Yeah. But... I don't think she was that young, though. I think she was, like, 20... Something like that, 19, what a nanny tends to be. Okay, I, I thought, I, I think of nannies as middle-aged British women. Fran Drescher. <laughs> there is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out. <laughs> <laughs>